but everybody, we're trying to maintain a, a schedule. We'll do some of the preliminary matters um, uh, until he gets here, and then we'll have a quorum uh, suitable for voting. So, Captain Fine, if you would kick us off, I think that'll call to order. Everyone stand and say a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful, another yet beautiful day in St. Pete. Uh, please be with us as we discuss the business of St. Pete College today, and please be with all the students, faculty, staff, and administration of this wonderful institution. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Recognitions. Mr. Chairman, at the uh, invitation of this board from last month, we have the 2013-14 men's basketball state tournament runner-up team, the St. Pete Ooh. College team. Gentlemen, please come forward. Watch your heads on those screens. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Law, members of the board. Uh, we stand before you to introduce you our basketball team. Prior to doing that, you all know Coach Crumbly. He is uh, uh, recently elected to the Florida College System <coughs> Hall of Fame. Thank you. Also with uh, Coach Crumbly is his assistant coach. Where is uh, George? George Carbart? Right, right there. Thank you, Coach. Um, we also had four student athletes that couldn't make it this morning because they're in class. Uh, <laughs> That's the story, Mr. Contest. That's correct. <laughs> With that being said, just a little uh, bit of information on these guys. So not only are they student athletes, they have to maintain a 2.0 GPA, but they've also uh, maintained a civic engagement. That means they, they participate in community service. So they've given back and they've been uh, awesome student athletes, all of whom have remained eligible this year. Um, and, and so that's something to applaud as well. And, and with that being said, um, I wanted you to know that not only were they the Suncoast Conference champs, but the state runner-up, but the sophomores that are here this morning have options. They haven't made their selections yet, which is good. So they have multiple options to select from in terms of where they're going next. So with that being said, I'd like for each, each of our member to come up, say hello, introduce themselves. Come on up. How y'all doing this morning? Um, I'm Reggie Smalls, and uh, I'm a sophomore. How you doing? Uh, I'm Colton Lewis, and I am a sophomore academically. How's everybody doing this morning? Doing well. I'm Jasmine Canteen. I'm a sophomore, 2013 to 2014 season, and I'm majoring in sports education. Good, good morning. I'm JBL Rahman. I'm a freshman, and my major is criminal justice. Very good. Good morning. I'm a freshman. My name is Prince Foster, and I'm majoring in criminal justice. Good morning. My name is Jose Santos. I'm a sophomore, and I'm majoring in liberal arts. Good morning, my name is Devontae Pratt, and I'm a freshman. Good morning, uh, my name is Jimmy Harris, and my major is um, accounting, and I'm a sophomore. Good morning, my name is Alton Roberts, I'm from Miami, Florida. I'm uh, majoring in public administration. Very good. Sure, yeah. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. 
Three, two, one. Do you feel little? <laughs> feel small. <laughs> There's a time in my life where I spent most of my time playing ba pickup basketball. I'm sure I couldn't dribble from one end of the court to the other. <laughs> okay, it would be embarrassing. So, did did Deborah just tell me that the chairman has arrived? I don't know. Okay, let's let's keep going. We'll keep going. I guess we open the public comment. There's no one, so close the public comments. Uh, comments of board members. Ms. Bell, do you have any comments? I just. I love our new meeting time. Oh. <laughs> I'm smiling. <laughs> I had the opportunity to attend the foundation's uh, um, scholarship, a luncheon. Was it last weekend? Le yeah. Last week, and I uh, just wanted to applaud the foundation. Uh, I just want to applaud um, the foundation and all the good work they're doing. If, if you hadn't had a chance to listen to the scholars speak, and uh, Dr. Law, those were three impressive students that spoke. Uh, very heartfelt and uh, making a difference, and the foundation is making a huge difference. I don't know where you found those three, <laughs> but each one was unique, and uh, St. Pete College is making a difference in the lives of a lot of individuals, and those three are great, great public speakers to represent that. So congratulations to the foundation and all Thank the good you. work. Thank you. We will. Uh, <clears throat> we are planning to have a report, uh, a sort of an update report on the foundation next month. Is that what we agreed to? Their their bo books closed last week or the first of the month, uh, and we will give you the the uh, the numbers, which are nice. But you're right, the the students. Excellent. This was as good as it gets. Yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, I just want to take a second. I probably should have done this when we had a moment of silence, but. Uh, we, we did lose a good friend of the college, Dr. Jim Goss, and Jim was a colleague of mine when I was here previously. He and uh, his wife, Teresa, at the time were, uh, were, were friends and colleagues. Jim did a great deal of work for our African-American males when, uh, as hard as that work is today, it was a lot harder when we asked Jim to, to lead that charge, and, and he did an excellent job, and we, we mourn his passing. <clears throat> Oh, we're at board comments? Your, your comment, if you like. Well, I got to meet the basketball team in the hallway. So, um, good morning. And um, uh, just one or two quick things. One is um, our building, Dr. Law, looks like it's going up very nicely. We had pictures. Um, and it is, it's, it's on its way. Um, it looks like the legislature, we're not going to end up so bad. Um, I know that's probably probably your report later on, report but I was just going to yeah. say that it looks like we're, uh, some of the media may have helped us a little bit yeah, along the way uh, mm -hmm. in the legislature, and um, and uh, I'm uh, I'll say it, but I didn't get to say it to the basketball team. I did tell them in the hallway, but I didn't get to tell them publicly in here. Um, you know, we're always proud of um, all these young <coughs> folks who are uh, actually moving in a positive direction. I think. Um, them being a part of St. Pete College is a positive thing, and the way that they have exhibited themselves has been a very good thing. So um, all the support that we can give them, we appreciate um, you all, uh, as well as other faculty and staff who have been supportive of them and their coach and everybody else, uh, along with the administration. So thank you guys for being a part of that. Thank you. Um, if there are no other board comments, uh, Dr. Law, you have any comments? Uh, Two minor, um, uh, we uh, have passed out this morning a revised personnel list. It simply re reflects um, 
some very last minute additions. You know, we've been doing it in the faculty hiring mode. And our goal was to get everybody here by April. We've got a couple of stragglers left, but uh, interviews and background checks and all went up to uh, through yesterday. So we give you a, an updated list. And uh, we're very pleased with that hiring. But let's go ahead and adopt the new list. You have them in your, uh, in your hands, OK? And then, Mr. Chairman, I just want to set the stage a little bit. It, you know, we have uh, been all in on, on the college experience, uh, our five-pronged uh, approach to helping students. And, and you've supported us. And we're very proud of the, the results. We have a Wednesday webinar. 8.30 to 9 every Wednesday morning where we report in. And we thought, since that is the real lion's share of our budget proposal, Mr. Chairman, we're going to do the, uh, the half-hour presentation for the board this morning, OK? okay. And you are going to see frontline staff with real ownership in the, the issues. We've the, the walkthrough. It's very tidy. Um, and we'll, we'll give you a chance to uh, <coughs> let's get through it, and then you can respond. But. Uh, uh, something a little different. So it's live. They're out at their workspace. This is how we do it every Wednesday okay. morning. So you'll get to see both our technology and our, our leadership and uh, more importantly our frontline staff. So that's the student success part. And I will report on Tallahassee at the end if you give okay. me a couple minutes. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, do I hear a motion to accept the minutes from the March 18 meeting? So moved. Second. It's been probably moving second. I'll signify by saying aye. 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 And unopposing, we go move on to our monthly reports. Mr. Lang, how are you this morning? I'm just fine. How are you, Mr. Chair? Good, good. Do we have a report? No, we have no report. Oh, that's all right. It's always good to see you here. <laughs> I just feel comfortable when you're here. Um, is uh, Ms. Gardner, good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Good morning. Good morning. Do you have a report this I morning? I do not. Okay. So we're on to uh, Ms. Brandt. Is she here? Hey, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Good, good. <coughs> I know you have a report. I do. And good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Um, trustees and Dr. Law. And again, I'm Carol Brandt, and I'm the chair of the Career Service Council. And today I'm just here to give you an update on our professional development initiative that began last March. And the initial goal was for all career employees to complete six hours between March and May of last year, and then to continue through the end of June of this year by completing 24 hours. And this was our inaugural year. So there were um, 16 months in this first inaugural year. But beyond that, we will go to a 12-month um, cycle running July um, 1 through June 30 of the following year, and continuing again with 24 um, units or hours of professional development to be required. And while we have um, approximately 10 weeks left in this year, um, I'd like to give you an update of where we're at right now and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and the progress that we've made so far. So to date, we have 300, we have, excuse me, 736 um, career service employees here at the college. And to date, um, 717 of them, or 98%, have um, participated thus far in professional development training for a total of 16,591 training hours. And currently, the breakdown is, um, as of two weeks ago um, when the report came in, we had 239 employees who have completed or exceeded um, the recommended hours for 39.2%. 93 additional employees are within four hours of completing that training, and another 146 employees who are within nine hours of completing the um, 24 recommended hours. We recently sent emails to all employees reminding them um, of, our, of our timeline and encouraging them to um, complete those hours by the end of the year. But I would venture to say that a large portion of the um, employees who have met or exceeded or have nearly met our um, emphasized goal, probably um, would come from the student services area. And a lot of that is due to the developmental education reform and the necessary training um, that has gone hand in hand with that, but also our commitment to the college experience initiative. And you will hear more about that report shortly, as Dr. Law just um, mentioned. Um, the Career Service Professional Development Committee which is comprised of members of our steering committee, as well as um, 
Anna Marie Root, our professional development manager here at the college, and Dr. Stan Vitito, provost at the Clearwater campus, um, we have submitted a um, professional development unit guidelines um, and, and just a way of d awarding credit for workshops, webinars, and courses um, that have been obtained not only through our professional development department and corporate training, but also for training taken outside of the college, whether it was conferences or um, professional development um, opportunities, and also for college level courses as well. And so although this year um, our large focus has been on our student services area, we continue to work to provide quality training for every staff member. And we're looking forward to Dr. Law visiting with each, um, at each campus with our career staff at our annual appreciation luncheon, where he recognizes and presents certificates to each career employee who has completed their, um, their professional development goal for the year. And then these efforts will all come full circle at, as um, a new career service evaluation system um, and committee has just been formed and we will be meeting. One of our goals will be incorporating our professional development into a new um, evaluation process that will be beneficial to both the college and to the employee. So we seek to be a well-trained staff and um, we look forward to providing the best opportunities of training not only for each staff member but also to become a strong workforce as um, we seek to um, provide the best services to our students to other staff members and also to our community in st pete college as a whole thank you Thanks very much. I, had a, I had one question yeah. how did you get 98 percent to participate <laughs> I mean that we, we initially started That's with a um, with initiative that at every campus we offered a this is how you do um, this is how you um, sign on and into the um, the skill port system which is our system by which um, training is offered through there or we tr it's our tracking system as well and so by providing it right at each campus we invited we invited the supervisors and all of the career staff at each campus to attend. I, I'm assuming some of the 2% are probably new hires, but not all. And those are ones that, you know, we'll, we'll want to follow up with. And well, continue. congratulations on creating a culture of professional development, because that's, I think, unheard of. I mean, at least in secondary education. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. <clears throat> Strategic focus and planning. Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, about a year ago, uh, in a pretty high visibility issue, the State Board of Education changed the State Board rules that had to do with faculty evaluation and hiring. And uh, we uh, convinced two of our, our real uh, thought leaders and uh, seasoned academics to uh, lead a process where we would then review our process. And uh, Heather Robeson and Dr. Martha Campbell uh, uh, have done that. Happy to let them present the work that they have done on behalf of the college. All right, good morning. Uh, good morning. As Dr. Law said, um, I'm Heather <coughs> Robertson. This is uh, Martha Campbell. Um, I'm representing FGO and uh, the faculty side of this and uh, Dr. Campbell. Dean Campbell of Communications is our uh, administrative uh, portion of this, and we'd like to uh, share some of the things that we've done uh, collaboratively, collaboratively to uh, improve faculty evaluations here at St. Pete College. Um, we actually had this as a priority in FGO for um, a few years now to update our faculty evaluation so that we could create a more meaningful process for administrators and faculty to uh, examine how they're doing uh, the primary portions of their job which uh, encompasses teaching and learning and about the time that FGO came up with the uh, um, initiative to reach out to uh, the administration to come up with a collaborative effort to revise our uh, faculty evaluations state board rule um, 6a was going under revision at the state level as Dr. Law mentioned um, one of the things that uh, worked out well was that a lot of what we were uh, incorporating in our criteria, a lot of the things that we were doing well and wanted to do better at St. P. College were actually part of the, B the board rule uh, revisions and that played very well into uh, kind of the, the uh, 
revisions that we were putting in place at the time. So we were able to incorporate quite a few of those. Um, you all should have a copy of the revised form that we're using right now, uh, starting this spring and this summer for faculty evaluations. Um, the form itself reflects key values here at SPC and uh, also updated State Board Rule 6A criteria, such as instructional strategies, student engagement, contri uh, contributions to the college, demonstrated and measurable contributions to student success um, so that we will be able to measure and evaluate the things that we value um, in our uh, primary function of teaching and learning here at uh, the college so that we can facilitate uh, professional growth. Um, you also have a copy of the rubric that we came up with uh, during our committee and, and our collaborative process. The rubric was something that uh, was missing for several years that faculty and administrators were looking for to kind of guide um, self-assessment and uh, administrator's assessment. Um, and we were very, uh, I guess, studious. We put it together. We use rubrics in our classrooms all the time for our students. Um, but we were really craving a framework that would give us a uh, consistent standard so that we would be able to uh, monitor expectations, be able to uh, communicate throughout the year about uh, how we're doing uh, what we do best, which is teach. Um, both the rubric and the form are, again, now in use for this spring and uh, during the summer for all of our uh, faculty evaluations and will serve as a basis for our digital portfolio, which we'll be, we are building at this point, hopefully during the summer, and we will start uh, using in the fall. I wanted to speak a little bit this morning about the digital portfolio tool. We're starting with a pilot of 20 faculty uh, in the summer who will be working um, to enter information into the digital portfolio tool. It's an important tool because it gives faculty a chance to collect artifacts from the various presentations that they do some of their teaching presentations as well, the good work that they do with their students, um, their uh, data that is related to student success. It gives them a chance to write a narrative, um, reflecting on their accomplishments for the year, and it uh, essentially houses their contributions and talents so, so uh, year to year, so they can build on that digital portfolio tool. Um, having come to the college uh, uh, 27 years now, I'm in my 28th year at the college, and having been a, a faculty member for um, 18 of those years, I would have really have valued uh, this type of tool. Uh, my artifacts are generally uh, locked up into uh, boxes somewhere, cardboard boxes. So I think this is going to be a great tool for faculty. We, we're going to need to train um, both the faculty and um, the deans as well on the use of the of the rubric on the digital portfolio tool um, and then how to work collaboratively uh, on an evaluation so that faculty have a chance to interpret the data related to their student success within a context of professional development. The idea is that a faculty member and a dean would sit down once a year at least and then monitor during the year and, and form a faculty development plan um, that is that will not only um, promote the faculty members' on, own personal professional development, but also help to um, promote the learning out, outcomes of the class and the courses that they teach. Um, I, we wondered if you, well, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. We actually have uh, a timeline uh, set up for this. Um, this is all still a work in progress. We've done uh, our, our, our best work getting this uh, done and uh, to the faculty and to the administrators for use, but we know our work is not done in any way, shape, or form. We're going to continue to uh, monitor and uh, provide feedback and revise as necessary as we go along. But our timeline actually uh, has us with spring and summer using the new form and rubric. Then in the summer, we have our pilot group that Dr. Campbell mentioned um, using the portfolio, really getting in there and playing with it uh, before we release it uh, to the entire faculty for training in the fall. So we want to get in there and, and see if there's anything we can cause to go wrong so that we can get it right for, uh, for fall. 
Um, then we're going to train full-time faculty and administrators, not just in the portfolio, but also in the uh, people skills area that Dr. Campbell spoke about in the fall of 2014. And then our plan is to have all of full-time faculty and uh, administrators that supervise them using the portfolio, digital portfolio, in spring and summer of 2015. And then phase two will actually be our, our adjunct faculty uh, training. We would like for those that group of uh, faculty here at the college to utilize this uh, valuable tool as well. So we're looking at training the uh, adjunct faculty in the fall of 2015, and then having them as part of the digital portfolio, um, and all faculty would be using it in spring of summer of 2016. Um, our collaborative effort between uh, FGO, the faculty, and uh, the administrators in our collaborative committee on faculty evaluations, um, we actually are going to continue that as a standing committee and annually throughout the year, but annually uh, we will actually be reviewing our faculty evaluation procedures and process and, and tweaking them and refining them as, as we need to so that we come up with the uh, best possible tools out there so that we can uh, use our faculty success as a foundation for student success. And we thought you might have some questions you might want to ask. Board members, any questions? <coughs> On student success rates, what, what defines that? Um, right now, student success is defined uh, through our data collection as anything a C or better. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, the, the uh, group has done a, an admirable job taking the state board guidance and putting something in. I want to emphasize the faculty itself uh, expressed a strong interest in making sure there was a viable and, f and full annual evaluation for each person. They right. want to know if there's something that's not right, and they want to do that. Secondly, um, it, it, we have crossed the divide. The use of data that's available to guide those discussions is in wherever we could get it. How many students are passing, success rates, uh, all kinds. If we can capture data, we are trying to learn how to use it better for everybody's benefit, and, and we've crossed that divide. And then thirdly, please understand, we did not abandon the student's ability to input on the evaluation of faculty as well. That still goes on what we call the SSI, the uh, st uh, student, student Survey of Instruction. Survey of instruction. Uh, that is ingrained and part of this process as well. So I think it's a major step forward. Uh, making an electronic <coughs> portfolio uh, is the first step toward a better transparency for all of it. So um, I say full steam ahead. And we have a, a recommendation in the budget to front end uh, the cost of so it's pretty marginal, 30 grand or something like that. So. Dr. Law, how, how is the student input um, utilized in terms of evaluating the instructor? The, uh, every student uh, evaluates in, in every class through an online uh, tool that we call SSI, and we're happy to show it to you, and it's got this memory serve 20, 30 questions that a student answers, and the, those are scored. Then those scores are uh, accumulated over the course of, of the, there's an open period for the student to, to uh, complete it. Those scores are then accumulated, and then they are sent back to the individual and to the dean. I know that when I meet with the deans to review faculty not on continuing contract, that's sort of the first area of business. We look to mm -hmm. see what those scores tell us. Mm -hmm. So I think they're ingrained. The faculty continue to refine. Does it work? Let me help. For some, you know, there is always, if, when you've got 30 questions, some really matter to a faculty member. Some, really don't. you know, they're not really on task for your particular course. But um, I, I think it gives us appropriate feedback. Uh, uh, Dean Campbell? Yeah. Well, the evaluation also, the new evaluation process gives faculty a chance to um, write a narrative reflecting on what it's they've learned about their I own really success. Good and areas of improvement that they need to make based on the students' comments and their evaluation. So it's a reflection that is intentional. Are students required to fill that out or is it optional? So how, what percentage do? It, it, it runs a very wide gamut mm -hmm. and we have started to put a great deal of pressure on getting that up to a, a I, I think, two-thirds of the students ought to do it in every course, every semester. Y you know, if it's on the, if it's on, on the, uh, 
the, the course shell, the student can do it whenever they want. So uh, we see some very low score uh, response rates in the 20 percent. We see a good number in the 80, 85 percent range. Uh, you, you've hit the area that uh, Vice President Cooper and I are working <laughs> are most diligently on. If we're going to do it, everybody should have a, a chance to input. I guess our goal in life ought to be to be as good as rate my professor, the <laughs> informal <laughs> system, okay? But we're not there yet, okay? But when they start giving out, what are they giving out? Uh, chilies, is that what they're called? Uh, yeah. Chili pepper. Chili pepper, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, that, um, chili peppers are not on the SSI. Uh, <laughs> no chili peppers. No chili peppers. So, so we only can fill out the, the, the students can only fill out the evaluations online, Dr. Law, is that? Uh, like no, they have a paper it? option if they, okay. if they so choose to do that. Um, usually it, it's initiated by, um, well, I, I take that back. It is not a paper option anymore. They have the ability to go into a uh, computer lab. So we actually do have some of our um, adjuncts that are brand new, some of our faculty members that are brand new, that their dean or their um, academic chair will, work, will request that they take the students over to a computer lab if the um, class is not in a computer lab. And, and that way we can encourage a little bit more. So, because we understand that not everybody, you know, has access to that online link. I'm sorry, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I do have a couple more questions. Um, so if you're on a continuing contract, Dr. Law, then most, when the, when the students fill out the evaluation, then it, the feedback is, it's still utilized to evaluate the instructor, right? That's right. That's, okay. that's part of the dialogue with the dean and the faculty member each year. Okay. Let me, we need to figure out how to make sure that every student has the opportunity to have a paper option in the class. Uh, because the only way we're going to get that feedback with the kind of time you're talking about, and, and, I, and the only reason I say this is I'm still a student myself, and I would not be going to a computer lab or on my computer to fill out an evaluation if, if it's not necessary. So um, there, you know, at the end of 15 minutes, at the end of a class, before the end of the, before the, end of the grading period or the semester, you know, what's the harm in having the, 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 like we used to do, take the evaluation into the class and ask the students to fill out the evaluation and somebody drop it off to the counselors, the dean's office, whoever, and then you have that feedback. Because I just don't see students going, even though, I mean, the option should be online as well too, but, you know, the way that I've seen where we're going to get the evaluations back is you take them to the class, ask one student to have them fill them out, and, and I don't know, Dr. Law, that may be against what we're trying to do in terms of being paperless. Don't get me wrong. I'm, nah. I'm not trying to go backwards. But I just want to make sure that students have know how much of a priority that it is to fill out that evaluation. I, I, let, me, let me see if I can join forces with you. But the other side of that coin is the student doesn't believe it's anonymous when they, yeah. when they hand mm -hmm. in a paper one right here. And I don't disagree with you because I don't believe mine's anonymous. But, <laughs> uh, so but I we, fill it out. That you was the, the other side of it. Um, <laughs> I I really think that given the ubiquity, you know, every it's in every syllabus. It's uh, you, you can do it whenever. There's there's a window of opportunity. Let us um, let us run a little bit to see how we can get that in. Okay, Sorry. we we share the goal that. A random pattern of who responds is not a good enough pattern. And it's okay. not. It's not. A, it's not. A, it's not a criticism of what you guys are doing. It's more of I want to make sure that each student feels like they have the opportunity to do that. Good. Well, I, I would even go further to say not just the opportunity, but the the responsibility. Yeah. I mean, do they know that that information is being used to evaluate that professor? Because I know when I get surveys from a hotel I stayed at or, or something like that. Unless I'm passionate one way or another, I'm not filling it out. Right. Yeah. So you're getting somebody who's either really, really happy or really, really not, and maybe not a it's really good film. indication of, of who that professor yeah. is the rest of the time. So We've been at it for a while. We, um, again, we, we talked to the folks who seem to make it work really well. They've got 88% response rates, and then we talked to somebody who has a 19% response rate, and it's on the fourth page of the learning shell, and yeah, you gotta wanna go see it. So we're, uh, we're, we're teeing that up. Look, we've gotta get through this, okay? This can't be our whole goal in life, is just to have an evaluation process. Sure. We gotta get the data and then have the kind of conversation that Dean Campbell was talking about. Oh, so, so uh, 
let me give high compliments to great uh, Heather job. and yeah. this yeah, is great job. a big piece that could have created more problems than we could ever solve and they have steered us to a very desirable spot so I think you. the rubric looks great I think you guys did a great job Thank you. I'm, I'm just talking about the net. Yeah. How do we get we'll, the students we'll to actually fill out the other part? And, and it's not done. We completely yeah. understand yeah. That, <laughs> that this is going to be refined as we go along. And uh, and faculty, this is this is very important to them. You know, they 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 want that type of yeah. feedback, but they also crave the um, the framework uh, to have that narrative in there to balance it out. Because the SSI right. and the grade distribution is not just no. the only part of it. They want to have the the whole uh, spectrum there as well. So. And and uh, and this is believe me, not a criticism of of what you all have done, you've done a great job. What, where I'm headed is I want to make sure that the faculty has what they need to be successful. Right. We have focused so much on our students. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the faculty has not just what Ms. Bello talked about, for t the two far extremes, but also the person in the middle who's going to give good critical evaluation of what they're doing right and what's wrong and that kind of stuff. So We thank you for your interest. Yeah. Yes. Thank important. you. And it's thank important. You. It's it important. Is. It's an important it part of this college. It is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I think we have a board rule later in the agenda, don't we, to implement the yeah. state That's board correct. rule. Okay. So that those two are yep. tied. Tied to each other. Unlike last month where we voted on the rule first and the presentation <laughs> second, we, we're trying a different approach, okay, with the presentation first and the rule second. Okay. Yeah. You tell us what you like best. Yeah. Okay. There's an online form to tell us if you want. Um, uh, this is the high point of the work we do. This is the college experience. Again, this we're going to go live here in just a second, but we do this <coughs> religiously every Wednesday morning, uh, and we capture the Vice President Williams, you're in charge. Yes. All right, so you have a folder in front of you, um, and that folder will, will uh, show you quite a few things. One, there's a picture of all of our presenters. They are all of our actual practitioners who are working with the students on the front line. You also have sort of like a rubric to explain some um, verbiage that we'll be saying throughout each presentation by the presentation. And then you have an actual copy of each and every one of the presentations that you're about to witness. So we believe we provided you with everything you need to really enjoy the work that the team has done. And so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Kelly, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kelly Zemack, and I'm the career specialist on the downtown campus. This semester, I've been reporting on the spring 2014 intervention strategies. We've been tracking the academic progress of students who are classified as warning, probation, returning, intervention life plan, restricted life plan students who are enrolled this semester. This first screen is a weekly snapshot of the areas we track. So there are a total of 4,377 students in our cohort. If we look at the My Learning Plan column, which has a header of this week's My MLP, there are 21 new learning plans this week. To date, 54% of our cohort has a learning plan. There were 47 new early alerts this week. To date, 22% of our cohort has received an early alert. Weekly Ws, this week we had 27 student withdrawals from 37 courses. March 26th was the last day for students who were enrolled in a 16-week course to withdraw with a grade of W. And to date, we have had 21% of our cohort who has withdrawn from a course. And if we look at the WFs, for students who have not completed 60% of their coursework in a 16-week course or withdrew after March 26th, receive a WF. This week, 355 students received a WF. And to date, there have been 929 students or 21% of our cohort who received a WF. And 29 new students visited tutoring this week. Next slide, please. Okay, so in one of my past reports, I reported the 10 classes that received the highest number of Ws through week three. This is being shown on the left. At, this time, at that time, ENC 1101, Composition 1, had the most Ws at 31. And MAT 1033, Intermediate Algebra, had the second highest at 17. On the top right are the classes with the highest number of Ws through this week 12. ENC 1101 and MAT 1033. I'm sorry, it looks like I just accidentally got muted real quick. All right, you're good. Okay, so on the top right are the classes. 
On the top right are the classes with the highest number of W's through week 12. ENC 1101 and MAT 1033 are pretty even, but MAT 33 had the most W's at 91. And we're keeping an eye on both of these courses because of flexible placement. Students who fit the criteria for flexible placement can decide to decline recommendations for developmental education and take ENC 1101 or MAT 1033. Seeing the high number of withdrawals, I wanted to compare the percentage of withdrawals of flexible placement and traditional placement students. As we can see below, flexible placement students withdraw from ENC 1101 and MAT 1033 at a 2% higher rate than traditional students. Next slide, please. As we saw in the first slide, we have a high number of students who receive a WF. Here are the 10 classes with the highest number of WFs. ENC 1101 leads the way with 124 students. Whereas MAT 1033 had the highest number of Ws, it ranked fourth in terms of WFs. Below compares the percentage of traditional placement and flexible placement students who received a WF for ENC 1101 and MAT 1033. And ENC 1101 flexible placement students received a WF at a 12% higher rate than traditional students, and a 3% higher rate in MAT 1033. And on the upper right are the 10 courses that sent early alerts through week four. Following the trend, MAT 1033 and ENC 1101 lead the way. And on the bottom, we can see this pattern continuing into week 12. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Kelly, thank you so much. I think we found a really important piece of data in there on placement and back and forth. So that's awesome. Okay. Good morning, this is Sue Kubler. I'm a student support advisor on the Clearwater campus. I'm reporting on the spring first time in college students that attended on campus orientation and specifically their progress in utilizing services which promote student success. This group consists of 644 students. Over 90% have received learning support services at least once their first session. Over the last 12 weeks, 599 have made over 4,300 visits to learning centers, open labs, and the new initiative programs. Next slide. In terms of career decisions, almost 80% of this group have indicated a chosen degree and field of study prior to or during their first session. Those remaining may need a little time. Staff continue to reach out to these students in an effort to invite them to a career development center to assess career interests, seek guidance from our trained staff, and spend time exploring career <coughs> opportunities. Next slide. 516 students from this group have started a learning plan outlining courses leading to their chosen degree. The college experience class has played a vital role in promoting this tool to students and advisors continue to work with students encouraging them to update their learning plans when changes are needed. The graph on the right shows how in three week stages the number of terms planned has consistently increased. Currently 128 students from this group have not started a learning plan and we recently made an attempt, a second attempt to reach them, encouraging them to meet with an advisor and begin the process. This concludes our report. Thank you. Good morning. This is Jennifer Palmer. I'm a career advisor on the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus. And this morning I will be presenting the integrated academic and career advising. We have two different cohorts that we are tracking this semester. Our first cohort that you're looking at is the fall 2013 cohort. During fall term, we had over 3,500 first time in college students. At the end of fall, we had 342 students that were still coded red or yellow in terms of their career readiness. And we are tracking them this current semester. So your first column on the left, you will see 178 red and 164 yellow students. That is our fall cohort. This is their second semester taking classes at the college. The next columns indicate the work that we are doing with those students. So through the first 12 weeks, you can see we've moved 27 red and 40 yellow students to a green status, meaning they've made a career decision and a major decision at St. Petersburg College. For the week 13, we had seven additional reds and six additional yellow moved to green. And so out of this 342 red yellow students that we started with, 
we are finally picking up steam and making progress with them and we have 77 of those students that have made a career decision. On the right, you can see that this population is still having some academic challenges. The first column that you're looking at is the group that's received a W, WF, or F during the first 13 weeks of the term. And you can see there that 33% of this cohort alone has already received a WWF during the semester. We are also tracking these students in terms of their early alerts and 23.4% of these students have received an early alert and are being contacted from a career coach. We can go to the next slide, please. This is our spring 2014 cohort. So first time in college during spring term. On the left, the very first column, you can see there was 1,378 first time in college students for spring term. And you can see the distribution there between the red, the yellow, and the green. The middle columns indicate the work that we are continuing to do with those students. So for week 13, we moved three red and four yellow to green. We also had a high number of complete term withdrawals. You can see that number 34 there in the purple. So 34 new students that were first time in college from spring have now withdrawn from all of their courses. If we move over onto the right a little bit, you'll see that the total of 76 for students that have withdrawn from all their classes represents 5.5% of the first time in college population. On the right, again, the number of students that have received a W, WF, or F during the first 13 weeks. This population is at 26.9% of all students have already withdrawn from at least one course. And the red students in particular are the ones that we're really keeping an eye on. They are at 28.9% have received a W or a WF so far. Our early alerts are slowing down percentage wise. What we're seeing is that students are now receiving multiple early alerts versus new students receiving an early alert. For first time in college students, 22.3 of all of our first time in college students have received at least one early alert. We move on to the next slide, please. This is our intervention slide with, again, just those spring first time in college students. So this is just the intervention with our spring group. We have been utilizing a system called School Messenger, which allows us to send automated phone and email messages to students. We started in week four, and we've continued to utilize that throughout the semester, in addition to utilizing direct personal phone calls from career counselors to these first-time in college students that are red or yellow to assist them with the career decision process. And you can see our week 13 there in the middle. Our totals, I just want to highlight, we've met with 185 of those red or yellow students, and we've met with several of those students multiple times, and you can see that in the duplicated column of 209. We move on to the next slide, please. In an effort to reach these students, we have a career decision hold. I'm going to explain what that is. During week 10, the Career Center puts a hold that prevents registration on all students that have earned 12 or more college level credits. So if a student is red or yellow and they have earned 12 or more college level credits, they will receive a career decision hold that prevents registration. The first group that you're looking at is that spring cohort. So we started with 55 students that received the hold and we've made progress each week. We are now down to 43. For the fall group, again, this was double the, the population and it's also their second semester. Yeah. We had 211 students that received the hold and that is down significantly to 142 students. For a total of 185 students with this career decision hold. It has worked really well for us. We are very, very strategic and careful with who receives the hold. And when we do get those students into our career center, we go through a lot of career counseling and helping them research different careers and occupations. And last but not least, our last slide is what we're doing 
every week, which is again continuing our direct personal phone calls to these students that are red and yellow and having them in our career centers to assist them with career and academic planning. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, done as always. Good morning, I'm David Wilburn. I'm a student support advisor at the Tarpon Springs campus and I'll be providing the, my learning plan update. Um, the first slide you're looking at is showing you <clears throat> on the left side the total SLS 1101 students including the dual enrolled and the students who have dropped uh, with MLPs. You can see that our zero terms is down to 195 and then our students with one to seven or more terms is up to 1238 and you can see the weekly change there below that and minus 20 on the zero and then the addition 20 in the one to seven or more column. On the right you can see the chart that's the total SLS 1101 students excluding the dual enrolled students who withdrew. Uh, the reason we do that to break that out that way is because there's 105 dual enrolled students taking SLS on the high school campus. Also you have 26 dual enrolled students on the college campus. This particular chart gives us a better pulse of what's going on with the standard college student on our college campus. So as you can see we're down to 66 total students with zero terms uh, that are in the SLS 1101 classes. And that's, so that's down to zero terms with 66 students and then 1,003 with one to seven or more terms. And our total's up to 1,069. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is just a drill down of the previous slide to give you a more intuitive look at the distribution of the terms entered. And you can see that, that we've got a good skew to the right. Uh, when we first started the first of the semester, you could flip the slides over and it would have looked the other way. So we've moved in the right direction. You can see over in the slide or the chart that's excluding dual enrolled students, we're at 94% with one to seven or more, uh, which is good with four weeks to go because last fall we ended the fall at 95%. So we're well on track to uh, meet that, that number or exceed it. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is a uh, weekly campus comparison to show the distribution of students among the various campuses. Um, I'll draw your attention to column F and you can see at the bottom there that we're at 86.4 percent uh, of students in SLS having the uh, My Learning Plan. And then over on the right, the, the G column, <coughs> excuse me, you can see a change of 1.3 percent from last week. Uh, next slide, please. This slide we like to take a look at uh, specific campuses who have, who have made uh, some pretty large jumps in, in previous weeks and this week we chose the open campus and you can see that uh, they're at 34 percent with zero terms and 66 percent with one to seven or more. Uh, I'd like to point out that in week 10 they were exactly opposite. They were at 66% zero terms and 34% one to seven or more. So in the previous two weeks, uh, they've really made some huge strides. And on the right, the chart two, you're looking at the sections or the classes. And I'll point out there are seven sections total in open campus, but you're only seeing five. That's because two of the sections already have 100% completion. Uh, these, these five classrooms, which I've also labeled with the high school they're being ta taught at, uh, it's my understanding that they teach the SLS in just a little bit different manner because they put the uh, classes on a my plan, a paper format and then enter them into the system later in the term. So we expect to see all of those numbers improve. Uh, next slide, please. This slide uh, depicts our efforts to reach out beyond the SLS 1101 students. Uh, obviously with 66 students left to, to get out of zero terms, we, we wanted to focus our attention on the various student populations on the campus to, get, to try and get this MLP spread throughout the college as a whole. 
Um, in, in column D is going to show you the quantity of the MLPs per the student group. Uh, column E is showing you the MLP percentage of that group. And then column F is showing you the, the weekly change for the group. This week, uh, on column F, you can see there at the bottom, we had 103 MLPs added. Uh, as a whole, we're at 48% for, for all those student groups. Uh, the people who really made some good strides this week were the, are African American males and females. Uh, you can see they've jumped their 12 and 12 for the females and seven for the males. Financial aid had a, had another good week, adding 34. Um, Mr. Strickland, dealing with the warning and probation students, added an additional 10 learning plans. And and you can, Jeff Cavanaugh has done an outstanding job with the veterans, adding nine plans this week. Um, I'd like to point out also that uh, Ramona Kirsch, dealing with study abroad students and the F-1 visa international students, has done a, done a great job. That, that number for the F-1 visa students, the 71.4% began at 32%. The 96% number down in the student support services, that's from George Carbart. He started at 37.3%. So we've got some folks really working hard and doing a great job to promote this MLP uh, for their respective student group. Next slide, please. The final slide is going to encompass the total student body with the terms entered. And you can see that the big number on the right, the important one, we added an additional 63 this week, so our number is up to 12,165. Uh, last fall was our, our previous best semester because we finished at 11,643 MLPs. So far, with four weeks to go, we're at 12,165. So we just stand to build on already a, a, a good term for adding MLPs. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Actually done. Thank you, sir. Good morning. This is Karan Jean Baptiste, academic advisor on the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus. I'm here to report on week 13's early alert activity. Let's focus our attention on the number 3,320. That number represents the total amount of early alerts um, that have been received so far this semester. That number is also significant because that is the most early alerts that we have received since the implementation of the early alert process. Um, I have two line graphs on the chart here. The orange graph represents the 2013 early alerts and, and the blue represents the 2014 early alerts. One of the things I want to point out with the 2013 early alerts, only in three weeks, week seven, week nine, and week 10, did, we res did more early alerts go out um, than, in week, than in year 2014. Um, for week 13, over on the right-hand side, we received 209 alerts. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, this slide here kind of breaks, breaks down the contact efforts that our advisors and coaches um, have been making to reach students. Um, I just want to point out the number 209. That's the amount of early alerts that have been received. Currently, we use three methods to contact um, students. We use phone calls, emails, and postcards. Um, the first bar graph on the left-hand side it says alert successfully addressed. Um, let me define what that means. Those are advisors or coaches who received an early alert on a student. Um, they reached out to the student and made successfully, successful contact. A meaningful conversation took place um, and the advisor felt that the issue was resolved so they closed out the early alert. The middle column in progress that signifies that a alert was received. The advisor or coach sent an email or a phone call to the student, but they have not yet received any response back from the student. Um, our advisors and coaches continue to follow up with this population um, two to three times before a postcard is mailed to their um, address on file in PeopleSoft. The last column represents students who have not yet been contacted. Our advisors and coaches continue to reach out to those students as well. They just did not make that effort at the time that I pulled the, um, the data. 
Next slide, please. Uh, this slide here uh, tracks our early alerts by campus and courses. So let me first go through and explain each column. Um, I have it broken down by individual campuses. The first column breaks down the courses. Um, the second column breaks down the amount of sections of that course that is being offered on that campus. The third column is going to indicate the students, the amount of students who are enrolled. Um, we have the week 12 alerts that were received and then we have the additional alerts for week 13. We have in the next column the percentage change from week 12 to 13 and in the next column there are the total amount of alerts that have been received in that course. The final column gives you a total percentage um, of students in those courses that received alerts. Um, this particular slide um, outlines our gateway courses. Those are the nine most highly enrolled courses um, that receive alerts. Next slide, please. The next slide is the same exact information, but it focuses on our developmental courses. Um, as you can see that the percentages are a lot higher in these courses. Um, as expected because these are the students who tested into developmental courses and need a lot more of our attention. Next slide please. This final slide takes a look at the students who are in gateway and developmental courses who voluntarily withdrew from the courses. Um, as you can see one of the things that stands out with the percentages is that there is great parity in our courses. So what this slide tells us that our students after they receive an early alert they are hanging in there um, with the courses and they're not voluntarily withdrawing. That concludes my presentation. Good morning. My name is Heather Disler. I'm the Associate Director for Learning Resources at the Downtown and Midtown campuses, and I'll be presenting on out-of-class support. I'll be sharing with you all the support and services that we offer students in our libraries, our learning centers, and the tutoring that we provide students. This first slide shows faculty engagement in the learning centers, libraries, and labs. This is when faculty members come into the learning center and provide academic assistance and tutoring to students. In week 12, we had 108 full-time faculty members come into the Learning Center and provide 125 hours of service to students. The top chart on the right shows the faculty distribution by campus. At St. Pete Gibbs and HEC Vet Talk, we have 29 full-time faculty members. And below that, it shows the actual number of hours by campus. So you can see at the Gibbs campus, faculty members gave 30 hours last week. At Tarpon Springs, they gave 27.5 and so forth. Additionally, that little note to the left there, in addition to the 30 hours at St. Pete Gibbs, and another 44.75 hours were given by full-time faculty members in areas outside of the LSC, and those are in the College of Education, CCIT, Technology, and the Music Department. Next slide, please. This next slide shows our class visits in the Learning Centers. A class visit is when a faculty member brings their entire class to the library or the Learning Center for an overview of services or a tour, or to work on a project and use the resources and the personnel in the center. So far this semester, we have delivered 267 class visits in weeks 1 through 12, and we've served 5,198 students with the class visit. In week 12 alone, we have 21 class visits. And in that breakdown that chart on the top right, eight of those occurred at the HEC Vet Tech, those, some of those were in the area of microbiology and working out with cadavers. At the downtown Midtown campus, there were five class visits. A lot of those were in the SLS college experience class and in composition. And then the attendance is below that. HEC Vet Tech, which includes the NIP program, there were 140 students in those class visits, followed by St. Pete Gibbs had 61 and downtown Midtown 46. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the workshops that are occurring in learning centers. And the workshops are when students come in in small groups and work with the learning center personnel. It might be a writing tutor or a math tutor. 
And some examples of workshops, a math workshop might be how to um, work on a graphing calculator, or it might be a math workshop on integers, or for writing, it may be how to write a thesis statement or persuasive essay. Cumulative workshops for weeks one through 12, we have 376 workshops scheduled this semester. So far, we've delivered 366 of them, and we've served 1,460 students in a workshop. Below that gives you a snapshot for week 12. There were 38 workshops in week 12, and we served 195 students. And then the breakdown by campus in the top uh, right up chart. Clearwater had 18 workshops. A lot of those were writing. There's several professors at the Clearwater campus that are requiring students to bring their paper into the writing center first and have it reviewed by a writing tutor before submitting it to the instructor for a grade. Downtown Midtown also had a lot of workshops last week. Some of those were on technology and writing as well. Student attendance below that for week 12. A lot of the students attended a library research workshop or writing, followed by science. Next slide, please. This gives you a look at the library instructions that we've been delivering. A library instruction occurs in the library where the staff member brings their entire class to the library for an instruction, and we share with students library online and all the databases and research tools that we have available for students. This semester, we've had 330 library instruction requests, and we have delivered 321 of them so far. We have served 6,612 students with a library instruction, so we're up over the number of students we served at this time last year. The top chart on the right shows you the number of students who received a library instruction by campus through week 12. Clearwater has served over 2,000 students with a library instruction, followed by St. Petersburg Gibbs, 1,167, Tarpon, 1,114, and so forth. And then I also wanted to share with you some of the top courses that received a library instruction last week in week 12. ENC 1101, that's our Composition 1, Comp Composition 2, SLS is our College Experience class, AML 1600, Afri African American Literature, and CCJ 2704 is Research Methods for Criminal Justice. We had a library instruction at the Allstate campus, and then Nursing. Next slide, please. This next slide shows you Smart Thinking, which is our online tutoring available to students. They can access smart thinking through our learning management system, ANGEL, and there's an easy tab for them to get to it. There's three main ways that students access smart thinking. A live session where they're sharing a screen and a whiteboard with a tutor, an online writing lab, and that is where a student actually submits a paper. It might be a Microsoft Word document, and then they upload it to smart thinking. The tutor reviews the paper and then provides a student with a summary and notes throughout their paper for improvement. And then the third method for accessing the online smart thinking is submitted questions. A student might submit a question such as a word problem for mathematics or the, for writing they might say, how do you do an MLA citation? Below that I'm showing you the comparison of writing services and math services on campus versus online. So for writing, Last week, 540 students came on campus for a writing session in the Learning Center, and 307 students sought tutoring online through Smart Thinking for writing. With math, you can see 1,024 students came on campus to the Learning Center versus 13 online. So clearly it shows the students prefer face-to-face -face for math there. Next slide, please. This is a quick snapshot of Smart Thinking just to show you um, usage times. Obviously, there was a peak last week on Thursday, so that might indicate that Papers were due on Friday. Below that, it says sessions by hour of the day. There was a little bit of a peak at 11 a.m. and then again at 10 p.m. Next slide, please. This next slide shows you total services given by campus. This is captured with Who's Next, and we have Who's Next kiosks at the entryway to all of our learning centers and libraries to be able to capture data and know what students are coming in for, what services they're seeking. You can see that all campuses are up on total services given. Um, this time, right now, we're at 6,822 for week 12 versus 5,072 at this time last year. This is a 35% increase in services over this time last year. Last slide, please. This is my last slide that shows you a breakdown of a subset of some services. You can see a lot of students are coming in for computer use. The next popular thing that they come in for is math and statistics, followed by writing and then science. Below that, is a snapshot of total unduplicated students by selected service for math, science, and writing. 
And then that last chart on the far right shows you frequency of student visits. That's how many times a student has come in this semester. So students that have come in one to two times, three to four, five to nine, or 10 or more. And below that shows you that we have served 12,626 unduplicated students. And that's a total of 78,511 visits this semester. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Duncan. And the final report is Lieutenant Queenie rubric that we follow. <clears throat> Good morning, this is Eric Carver with our Center of Excellence for Teaching and Learning. Talk to you a little bit about our developmental education reform, our faculty training piece. Um, as you can see from the slide, you have four individual columns, and those columns represent modules that are embedded in a course. Uh, we are currently working with uh, 300, uh, a total of 374 faculty members that um, teach or engage gateway courses, and we have a list of uh, nine gateway courses that those, those faculty members work with. Um, the first module you can see is a, a dev ed overview to explain a little bit of how uh, Senate Bill 1720 will impact classrooms and student populations. <coughs> Moves a little bit more uh, specificity in the second one. And then modules three and four are embedding success strategies. Um, we've had some nice gains from last week. Um, roughly uh, 20 to 22 faculty members have completed modules one and two. Um, and we continue to build a spreadsheet and communicate with the deans each week, uh, those faculty members that are, are, have completed the modules and where they are in the process. It's also noteworthy to mention that we have um, 47 other faculty members that are non-associated with these gateway courses that just wanted to get a better understanding of the Senate bill and the training, so I added them to the course. So they took it upon themselves to to uh, complete uh, this training program. Certificates are presented once they're complete, um, and we continue to build in new faculty members, um, adjuncts as they uh, come on board and move forward. And that concludes my presentation, unless there are any questions. Good morning, I'm Yvonne Williams from the Office of Professional Development and HR. And this morning, I will be giving you an update on the training initiatives for the advising staff and the student services staff. As you can see from the slide, we are now at a 21% completion rate for our 30 credit hour advising course, and that's up from 14% last week. And we are at a 67% completion rate for the baccalaureate advising, up from 66% last week. We are also reporting a 32% completion rate for customer service. And also, I would like for you to note that customer service training is for all student services staff. And the baccalaureate advising and 30 credit hour advising are for advising staff only. This completes my update. Good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, well done. Thank you. We do this every week. We, we, we are focused on how different groups are making their way through the institution, who's falling by the wayside, who's being supported, how we can continue to refine the initiatives. This is our major effort, and you see, we don't do any problem solving online. We simply report in if there's something we want to follow up on, we do it offline so that we can get through <coughs> it. I, 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 and I want to just say one more time. The fact that this is the frontline staff making this presentation makes me exceptionally proud. These are not the higher ups who designed all this. These are the people who are making it work every day. So, uh, more power to them. They're, they're, they you, really you are, are doing a nice you job. Better be, you better be careful, Dr. Law. They're going to say you're running it like a business. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, and our students, we, we kind of know, know how our students are getting through and how to get help to them at the right time. And 78,000 of them thought the learning centers were a good idea. And uh, uh, more than 100 faculty holding uh, office hours and help sessions. I, yeah, that's a heck of a business. Business, Mr. Yep. Chairman. Good, good data. Yes. And everyone who uh, presented did a great job. Um, this is a, this is a, the nuts and bolts. I mean, and uh, you guys are definitely getting it. I mean, some of this data you wouldn't be getting if you weren't tracking it. So. That's it. I want to use that as a lead-in then to our uh, budget and finance. We're going to do the uh, the uh, uh, first of our sort of. Uh, operating budget presentations you will see this it's the April meeting we'll take your we'll show you where we are we'll take your input today 
Um, and then next month we'll bring you, uh, you know, the, the next to final, the beta version, the next to final plan, and then from there uh, we can uh, certainly have it done by June. Uh, last year we were able to do it at the May meeting. Jamel, you are in charge. Okay, good morning. So as Dr. Law mentioned, today we want to specifically focus on our Fund 1 operating budget, um, how our funding is looking, and then also what we're looking to do to fund the priorities that you really want us to work on this year. So when we start off looking at last year's budget versus this year's budget, obviously student tuition and enrollment is a big piece of that. For the current year that we're in, we had budgeted $63.8 million as our budget, which you know from our monthly budget reports, we have been running underneath because of enrollment. So starting off for FY14-15, if we have a flat enrollment from where we think we're going to land this year, that's going to take us to a $62.4 million tuition budget, which starts us off with a deficit of $1.4 million in funding. <coughs> So when we look at how we might fund the strategic plan, first we've got the deficit that has um, resulted from enrollment currently. Then we're looking at the possibility in funding our auto class support of possibly raising our learning access fee from a, by a dollar, which would give us about $600,000. From what we're hearing from the state right now, the $66 million that we get um, between our community college program fund and our lottery, we believe we're still going to receive about that. It might just be switching from CCPF debt over to lottery funding. There's going to be performance funding that's going to be provided by the state. And again, when we kind of estimate what we think that we might receive of that, we're looking at about $2.7 million. The state's also going to be providing for colleges $1,000 for every industry certification that's given. And as a low estimate right now, we're believing we might bring in about $150,000 in revenue from that side of it. And then operating costs of new facilities, the state saying we would get $800,000 there. In addition, we were looking at where we might reallocate either dollars or reduce expenses. So when we go through all of our budgeted positions and looking at open positions we currently have and savings that might result from that, as well as open positions we'd be able to re reallocate, we found about $300,000 there. Our utilities budget has been higher than the last few years than what we've actually been seeing in, in actual expense. So we believe that could be lowered by $275,000. And then as you'll see, when we walk through the requests that we suggest to use for the priorities, we really wanted to try to sync up some funding for things that are just going to be one time instead of looking for recurring money to do that. One example is looking at funding the loan default prevention strategy with $155,000 from some auxiliary funding that we would move over for one time. Also, there are some college experience um, infrastructure technology expenses that would be one time that we could fund from some one time technology money. So with all of that added together, that gives us $3.8 million to fund our plan. So with that money, we know that there's going to be a retirement increase this year that we need to place in the budget. The state does give us revenue to, to pay for that, but then it just flows through to our expenses. We don't know that exact amount yet, but we believe it's about $200,000. If we were to give a 2% salary increase, that would result in about $2.2 million. And what we've looked at in the way of strategic priority funding, we believe we could fund $1.9 million in projects. $1.5 million of that would be in recurring funding. However, with all of that right now, we're sitting at about a half a million dollar deficit. And we're still waiting for a lot of the final numbers to come through from the state. So again, going back to December when we had our um, board planning session, we really have focused this entire budget session on making sure that we're funding everything for the strategic priorities that you've addressed. So College Experience Student Success Initiative, um, we'll be going through the details, but we're looking at $776,000 there. Workforce, $166,000. Out-of-class support and learning opportunities, $345,000. Employee professional development, just over $100,000. The student loan default rates, $155,000. And then our marketing and information campaign, $339,000. And when you look at all of those from a, um, a percentage of what we're looking to fund, between the college experience and out-of-class support along with the student loan default rates, that's about 70% of the overall $1.9 million that we're looking to fund are the priorities. And so now we're going to go through the details of what makes up those dollars. 
This is interactive. I'm trying to, if you have, this is where your questions are both welcome <coughs> and, uh, and, you know, challenge us closely. This is our, okay. our best game and you should help us make it a better game. Okay, so with career services, um, during our meeting in December, you indicated a need for us to move our program from more of a transactional program where we're just telling students, hey, you need help with this, you need help with that, to a more developmental program where it's intentional and we work with them from the time they start all the way through the end, including um, transitioning them into the workforce or into another program. So by uh, moving and repositioning some positions and asking for new positions, we should be able to meet our next phase. The student coaching system. This is a system where we capture early alerts. Faculty and staff use this system. And the funding we're asking for here is gonna help us maintain the system and expand it to include journaling and some other things that the staff needs. New student orientation. This is a very small amount that's being asked for. Although we're working very hard to change our program, <coughs> this is for resources for our students um, when they come to the orientation session so that they're prepared for their first day. We have several positions um, that we're requesting to help campuses in various areas from disability resources to frontline staff to helping with veterans and you'll see some of those listed here. Some of these may not be exactly within the college experience but they make up the college experience. They are a part of what our students need to get through the sessions. Tanja, let me make one point there. We've been pretty mindful of trying to find resources for downtown midtown mm -hmm. so that we don't have them all in next year's budget. Mm -hmm. So if we can s find resources this year, get the programs and services up and running, uh, that, that then gives us a little more flexibility because after July 1 next year when we open the, down, the midtown campus, we're gonna need uh, exactly. additional new resources. So we've been a little bit proactive on that. So you see a financial aid counselor, well received. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the final focus in this area would be improvements to my learning plan. We're still um, researching right now for the best software to use that will be um, easy on the eyes, easy to use, um, and user friendly for students. And so we will be looking for funding to help expand that so that we can get the entire college family to use it. In regards to expanding our workforce offerings, as you heard earlier, there are industry certifications that if our students obtain these, we can uh, obtain a thousand dollars per, per certification. Mm -hmm. And so we feel that the best way to support uh, this initiative is to set up our own testing center where students can come in and of course sit for those exams and also to provide students with uh, vouchers for the exams because they run anywhere from $86 to $220 per exam. And so we feel if we can uh, give this support, then in the end we will be ahead. As you can see on our plan below, uh, there are listed the industry certifications that are available to students through our various programs. <laughs> the particular cost of the, um, the voucher to take the exam, and then uh, what we are hoping to gain. We have been very conservative in estimating that 75% of the students who we uh, give the test voucher to, who then have to participate in a test prep for our session before they sit for the exam and then provide us with their uh, results. We're hoping that it will be better than 75% who are successful, but we wanted to be conservative at the, as a first step. Some of the other areas that we are uh, wanting to support is that we currently have a computer literacy requirement for all of our <coughs> students. Some of our students come to college with the ability, so we want to accelerate their progression by allowing them to take a standardized test, and if they achieve the uh, particular results, they can then uh, get the credit and not have to take the course. And so we feel that this is helping to accelerate their progression. Uh, we would also at, like to add a client account representative to our corporate training. We feel that there are more companies and organizations in the area that we have professional training that they may be interested in, and so that we can expand our enrollment in corporate training. We feel that this will help to support that initiative. 
In regards to expanding our out-of-class support, uh, we have various needs. Uh, as you heard this morning, many of our students are coming, but there are more that we feel we can serve. Uh, in regards to our health education center and uh, veterinary technology. We want to provide additional services, additional hours to students who need help in writing and research, uh, mm -hmm. particularly in the upper division courses. We also know that in regards to our online courses in the sciences, when we look at the success rates of our students compared to those in the face-to-face -face modality, that they are behind by eight percentage points. And so we want to add uh, virtual science tutoring uh, opportunities for our students. In our math online courses, they uh, come in about six percentage points behind those in the face-to-face -face classes. So we know that more can be done there. Uh, we, as you saw uh, this morning, we have had more early alerts in regards to uh, computer usage and skills and so we want to provide more opportunities for our students to get help in regards to uh, the computer courses. We have added additional science classes at our Seminole campus so we know that there is an increase in the need for science tutoring and so we want to be able to provide that and we know that for many of our students the math courses are the gateway to their being successful in completing their degrees. Mm -hmm. So we feel there are additional uh, students whose needs can be met by adding additional hours and services at our Tarpon Springs and St. Pete Gibbs campus. Some other areas where we would like to add academic program <coughs> support are in regards to <coughs> our uh, associate in science uh, health degree program. Uh, we want to add a part-time academic advisor. Uh, this program currently has 1,517 students in it, with the potential of that rising to over 3,000. Uh, this is the particular program where students who are interested in one of our health fields, who may not be accepted into that particular program because of limited access, will be able to acquire a degree that's meaningful and that will provide them with work options. Uh, we also want to add an academic chair to add administrative help to our uh, AS degree program in veterinary technology uh, to assist in making sure that students uh, have access uh, to uh, having their questions <coughs> answered. And we also want to ensure that our adjuncts have access to uh, an individual uh, who is knowledgeable about the program and can assist them in making sure that they are providing our students with all the necessary tools to be successful. We also want to add a part-time administrative specialist to our College of Computer and Information Technology. Uh, we currently have two uh, staff assistants, but they serve five campuses. And with the growth in this particular program, we feel that this is important to, again, be able to provide the needed support for our students to succeed and our uh, program to continue to uh, grow. Finally, uh, the Project for Accountable Justice, as you have heard before, we are partnering with those in Tallahassee. Uh, we want to continue this partnership. It provides our students with opportunities that we would not have available to them in our public policy program. Uh, and we would also like to be able to provide our lead instructor with the opportunity to participate in some of those programs that are taking place in Tallahassee. This has been a successful program, and so we feel that it is important for it to continue. This is our default prevention roadmap. We felt it would be helpful for you to see the six stages of default prevention and who was doing what with the stages. On the far left, you see SPC. So we would be working with students while they were in school that have borrowed, doing class presentations, more entrance and exit counseling, uh, more communication by text and phone while they were with us. The company we would be outsourcing with, Senate, would be handling grace period, repayment, and the various stages of delinquency. This is a company that has had the highest service rating for the last two years. Uh, their research has shown when they speak with a student on the phone, they have an 85% success rate of helping them get out of delinquency. 
in addition to that high service phone support they also have a loan <coughs> portal that we're going to put within PeopleSoft so when our students accept or decline a loan they can see all their loans in their monthly payment and maybe think about borrowing less uh, they also have a mobile app uh, but we feel having that additional service with repayment deferment and forbearance is very much needed and it's the right thing to do and this is the right time to do it they have projected that where we're looking at a 32 percent default rate a year from now that in working with them over a year they would lower our default to 18 percent so we're excited could I ask how many how many companies did we look at to 12. outsource this? 12? 12. And it's going to cost us 155. What does it translate into from an 18 to 30 whatever percent from a dollar perspective? Well, the 155 is $12,000, 900 a month. Uh, and they will work all three loan cohorts during that time. So as time goes on, as we lower <coughs> Or delinquency, it should lower our costs as we move forward. Okay. Uh, for the marketing component, uh, the strategies have already been previously shared with you in what we call the grid. Um, but we are focused right now on how we can increase the conversion of those inquiries that we've already ob obtained. And so um, we are looking at a, a slight increase in SSH for marketing strategies, but the majority of what we'll be looking at uh, will be from. Um, better processes and and conversion strategies for those inquiries to to enable them to move through the funnel um, we're also uh, implementing an enhanced application as well as web chat within the application we notice in Google Analytics um, we have a lot of individuals that will start the application but not complete it so with web chat in the system we'll be able to help them in order to convert We've also recently transitioned the recruiters over to the MPI team. <coughs> so with that, we are looking to um, two main areas of, of increased customer service and application generation, as well as how we're going to reach out into the community and ensure that we can continue the community outreach portions. Um, we'll be looking at data, the number of inquiries that move through the, the system um, to application, as well as the immediate response time that those recruiters are able to provide. Um, We'll also be creating, um, or we are creating right now, drip strategies that will go out to to the, to the inquiries in order to help them to convert and consistent messaging and communication throughout the entire process. Increases in regards to professional development, as you heard earlier, will include the obtaining of the digital portfolio tool for our faculty mm -hmm. evaluations. Uh, this will allow us to house the documentation and streamline the process. And we also want to add support to our Center of Excellence for Teaching and Learning. They are uh, responsible or in, and insist in the tracking as well as uh, loading uh, the various faculty members into the different courses. And they will also be providing for training in regards to the use of the digital portfolio tool, as well as providing any technical assistance that may be uh, needed by our faculty members. So we feel that this will help to move this forward in a timely fashion. Can I? I'm sorry. I, sure. Um, I noticed something last month when we met, and I didn't say anything, and, and now I'm kind of noticing it again. So I'd like to ask the question. There seems to be an intense focus on getting the student to the application. And what I saw last month that I didn't ask about was that that almost was like one separate initiative from increasing enrollment. And as you were speaking, you were saying application, 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 application. The next. Good, good great question. <laughs> we're, no, no, no. That, seems to be a disconnect no, no, between that. I think, we, I think we have a good answer for you. Okay. We, we broke the into two separate problems two separate uh, processes, inquiry to application, and then application to enrollment. So one group, Diana's group, is working on inquiry to application. What are all the steps to keep somebody moving forward? Once they then get under the umbrella, let's not lose them at that part. So now Tanja has, in her area, Patrick Bernard and others, have a very detailed revised mm -hmm. metric to go from application to make sure we get <coughs> students registered. And we're happy to demonstrate mm -hmm. that. We've got 
that piece <coughs> for me. Yes. So I think we've got the whole thing connected. It's just not the marketing people's job at a certain point to make sure the testing is done and all of that. So I think we've got both in the, the crosshairs mm -hmm. some work to do in both areas. Are those two teams intensely communicating and, and working with each other and on the same page? And I, I mean, them describe. I would yeah. say very intensely. Very. <laughs> in fact, there's actually we'll we'll uh, the next presentation will hit some more highlights of that. I think and be able to. Well, describe what question. what kind of coordination, Tanja. Um, Diana has worked with us on um, the metrics and and what to use when we call the students, what to say, how long do we pursue them, and then we flip them back over to marketing. Marketing picks them up again after we pursue them for 10 days with phone calls, emails. That's the day after their application is received, we're going after them. So if an application comes in tonight, in the morning, the advising team gets that information and they're on the phone calling them. And that's after Diana's team has worked with them to get through from inquiry to application. So we do have one process, and we can come back and, and do a, a presentation on the whole process. What you're seeing now, uh, she's sharing her half, and I'm sharing mine. This is where the new money is going, is the application, the uh, inquiry to application. Mm -hmm. That's We didn't have the resources in place to do to that, do okay? It. On the application <coughs> to mm -hmm. enrollment, we just have changed a lot of processes. Mm -hmm. We've got... We've got resources exactly. on the field, resources. but the processes were archaic. So we, we're not devoting a lot of new resources to that. So the two together make a, a, a whole. I, I, I think we're on. We'll be happy to display and, and get yeah. feedback. But well, if the, I mean, if there's go. more later, I'll be quiet. I just, from the perspective of, you know, Devron and, and Laura Lee are famous for saying in the business world, um, in the corporate world, I, to me, it seems like a disconnect of and people do business with people they like and if their initial contact is and I don't know the people so I'm gonna say mm -hmm. Diana and they love Diana and then we kick them to Tanja and they don't like Tanja we can lose them so it it was just it to me like I said after seeing it last month and then hearing application application so I'll be quiet until no, no, you get to the second part of the uh, presentation and here's the I, I, I'm with you. If I get somebody who I connect with on Delta, right. I love to do that. Um, first of all, the skill set changes a little bit. After a while, it, it, one skill set is to answer students and help them get registered. Sure. Then, then we start. There are some things that mm -hmm. have the rules mm -hmm. that have to go there. Here's, here's the part that, that maybe the business, the outsiders could help us. At some point, I really need her folks to keep going on the recruitment side. And if they're busy following the paper trail to get a student registered, who's doing the recruiting mm -hmm. while they're doing that, right? So you have a little bit of a separation mm -hmm. there. So let, let, let's stick with it. I think we're, we're trying to, you gotta fix the processes is what mm -hmm. happens. Sure. Okay, quit running students off. So that's, yeah, that's first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, all right, we'll keep going on this then, okay? But, but we're gonna show you some stuff on the enrollment plan and, and it's gonna go right back to the same thing, I think, Ms. Bellow. Okay, I'm going to speak to the third bullet on the professional Ms. development. Ms. And we have a num number of other training initiatives planned, including our ever-expanding large-scale training events like Spring Training Day and All College Day. But in particular, there are a couple of things that, that we're very energized about that we believe will be transformational in the area of employee engagement and success. And one of them, uh, Carol Brandt alluded to earlier, and that is a complete overhaul of our career service evaluation system. And we plan on linking that directly to employee growth and development, and it will be much more proactive that employees and supervisors actually look forward to, relates to college values, and translates to a more meaningful growth plan. Uh, we actually, this week, have commissioned the group. It's a college-wide multidisciplinary group that will be working on this over the next several months. And I fully expect that the end product is going to be something that will be a benchmark and a standard for other organizations. So we're very much looking forward to that. And the other thing is updated employee onboarding programs. <coughs> we hear a lot about what we're doing in the realm of student onboarding and getting them through the enrollment funnel and into the classroom. Likewise, we want to do the same thing with the employee experience, getting them through the hiring funnel and to the job and through their first year so that onboarding is not an event <laughs> like an orientation, but it's an actual um, continual program. 
Uh, the last item there is that we, there's a small amount of funding for our Association of Florida Colleges uh, group. Uh, they attend a number of regional state conferences throughout the year, and so we're providing some, some funding to attend those conferences and uh, other office supplies and things of that nature. Um, okay, let's see if we can recalibrate here. We've got a couple things going. So you saw the budget with the numbers with no growth built in and with sort of the worst case scenario from the legislature. There's, there's two other pieces now. We have a goal to grow the enrollment by 3%. So we have purposefully held that out. We want to walk through that because when we put that in the budget, it's going to change the available funds and some other kinds of things. So let's let's make sure the board is comfortable with our focus here for the three percent. Okay. Uh, we've set a three percent per year uh, goal for the at least the next three years, and that would amount to about eighteen thousand student semester hours per year. And I think to go uh, to what Ms. Bello brought up, we've we've categorized all of our strategies into. Uh, four major areas, uh, marketing and recruitment and retention, which is the part that Diana just spoke to, that we, we anticipate we can uh, get about 19% of that 18,000 SSH simply by, by converting more inquiries over to, to application. Uh, the second is the other one we just talked about, and um, Tanj, if you want to comment a little bit more on that section we sure right now we're converting only 41 percent of our applicants into enrollees and that's with no effort now we are contacting them immediately and working with them to help them through that enrollment funnel to get them ready for class and so we want to increase that from 41 percent to 46 percent for the um, fall term and so that is what our team is working on to get students moving through the funnel instead of them trying to find their way on their own. We <coughs> want to take them through and help them personally. And we, we also identified a third component that is related to that registration piece, and that is the registration to payment retention or conversion. <laughs> Just in the fall last year, uh, of, the, of this year, fall of this year, after, when all was said and done, the, the first day of classes, we had lost over 8,000 student semester hours of people who registered all the way through the process at various times, but when it came down to it, never paid. And yet they occupied a seat in those sections that entire period. So we're going to take on some strategies to, uh, one, require some eligibility requirements, make, make sure you've paid <coughs> some, done some basic things, done your financial aid forms, because we found a lot of students don't do those things, and they comprise a lot of those ones that drop. And, and don't end up paying. So some eligibility requirements, we are also going to push, promote very heavily our tuition payment plan throughout the process. So no matter how you're paying, whether it be financial aid, cash or whatever, we want to get you, we want to get you to secure that seat and by the tuition payment plan promotion, we think we will get more students to take advantage of that. And uh, We will also I have a comment there about we'll have online assistance. If any student is deemed as they go through that process to not to have to do something, we're going to provide the resources right there online for them to do it without having to go to another campus or, or call or whatever. So We also believe that obviously if we can keep more of our students and have them continue uh, and they are successful <coughs> and they have a good experience, that that will help to increase our enrollment as well. We have partnered with our student affairs team in mm -hmm. regards to all that they're doing in the college experience area, and Dr. Williams is going to talk a little bit about that. Well, one of the first things we're working on um, is reconnecting with those students who did not return from the fall. Um, we did lose about 4,000 students for various reasons. We have a campaign going on to get them back engaged and get them back enrolled to work with them through what the, whatever their situation is to get them moving. And as you heard earlier, we're expanding our early alerts, working more strategically with the faculty and the advisors who are working with students. And um, we're also offering more tutorial services to help students through their classes in our proposal from the budget presentation, which is very key. 
Our deans have created a retention, progression, and completion plan that will be vetted through our faculty governance organization, asking them for their endorsement as, and support as we go forward. There are three main focus areas to this plan. The first is program connection and clear academic pathways. We want to reach out to those students that express right when they enter uh, an interest in a particular program area and reach out to them and ask, answer any questions that they might have. And then when they have achieved their uh, 30 credit hours and they have chosen a particular <laughs> career path as well as a uh, program, we want to have an open house. We want them to come in and have an opportunity to meet the faculty to meet existing students in that program so they have a sense of connection and they know who they can go to to ask questions, they know who their uh, future faculty members will be uh, because when students have that connection they're more likely to succeed. We also want to define the academic pathway for our students so they'll know what courses they should be taking and in what sequence they should take the courses to be successful. Uh, we also want to ensure that there are delivery and course success strategies embedded. Uh, this can be everything <coughs> from providing our students with up-to-date instructor pages so they can know who their faculty members are before the course starts, providing the syllabus uh, at least seven days before class starts so that students can plan ahead and be prepared uh, rather than waiting until the first day of classes for that to be available. Uh, there are many other success strategies that can be embedded into courses. Uh, group work, we know that students do better sometimes peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, learning center opportunities to bring the, course, the class over uh, and provide them with uh, different uh, scenarios in regards to uh, working out the course material. And we also know then students are more likely to be successful and persevere if they're engaged outside the classroom as well. And this can be by participating in clubs, student government, study abroad, civic engagements, service learning projects. And the more we can encourage our students to be a part of those particular activities as well, we know the more likely to succeed and to persevere. So these are the main areas of focus in our plan. Also in building our schedule for the 2014-15 year, uh, we looked at a number of different criteria. We wanted to first of all ensure uh, that the uh, areas for growth were based on high need, high demand. So we reviewed current job openings and projected job openings for each of the fields. Uh, we wa wanted to look at the attractiveness to the online market. Some of our programs are totally online, so we may be able to go beyond our borders to attract other students or other niche populations. Uh, we wanted to look at recent growth. Uh, obviously, students are very good at informing us as to what they want and what they're interested in, so we wanted to use that information. We also wanted to look at other articulation opportunities with other schools. Um, in regards to providing students with if we have an AS degree and they could go on to another university to complete a baccalaureate level degree and they will accept our credit hours then that obviously makes a nice uh, ladder progression for our students if we don't have that particular program uh, currently and we also wanted to look at the existing capacity. Obviously, uh, we know there's a great need, for example, in our AS degree in nursing, but because of the limit to clinical space, that uh, being able to grow that program is much more restricted than, say, our bachelor's degree, which is totally online in our nursing program. So this chart is a spreadsheet with several different columns related to the budget. So the, the first one, FY14-15 estimate, um, that had in there just all of the basic information before we added in any information related to increased costs, so all the costs that I went through um, at the beginning of my presentation. The second column then um, includes all of the budget requests as well as the pay raise. And so all the things that we spoke about, which puts us at a $500,000 deficit. The third column includes all of the things I've spoken about, but also the impact of a 3% enrollment growth on the revenue. So you can see that puts us at an $800,000 
bottom line to the good. And then the last column is another alternative, which has the 3% enrollment growth in there, but that $1 increase to the learning access fee has been removed. And so then that takes us, gives us about a $159,000 um, budget surplus at the moment. And this is, again, is for the operating budget. I want to be sure we uh, don't speak too too quickly because we don't have to make any decisions today. <coughs> the 3% enrollment growth, we worked very hard to make sure it's a realistic strategy. And I think I'm prepared to recommend that we put that in the budget. Uh, we, of course, we are so focused on the college experience, and you saw all of that today, Mr. Chairman. You know, the, the $1 access fee, we know, you know, everything is no, 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 but you saw the demand. We, we have to expand the tutoring. We have to expand the hours. We have to expand the, the follow-up on the other. I mean, we have to keep that program growing. So my proposal to you was going to be a dollar uh, per credit hour. And we, it, in the access fee, it's pledged directly to all of those. It's not pledged to the general fund. It's pledged to those kinds of things. Um, and then lastly, I had, uh, you know, we have a 2% enrollment, uh, excuse me, a 2% uh, compensation adjustment in there. Um, had a lengthy conversation with with Trustee Westing yesterday, and and of course she's very involved in that. And I indicated that we would um, uh, have discussion here today, of course, but that uh, we would leave that subsequent to last time, to to next time. Her her issue is the same. If we build it in the base, we are committed to it going forward. How comfortable are we with the? The, the recurring parts of our budget. Can we afford that as a recurring item? Should some parts be contingent? And I think that's a legitimate discussion. I don't have uh, particular insights one way or the other. So Mr. Chairman, this is where we find ourselves. Why don't I be sure that if the board is uncomfortable with any of the activities or if the approach we're taking isn't meeting your need or if there's some additional information, that's the April to May work that we do to come back to you with better answers or, or more detail on, on what we're working. So this is the time for you to give us some, some good guidance as to where we go next. Board members? I have a question. What are we basing on the 3% increase on? I mean, in, in enrollment in schools, there's an enrollment funnel. Are inquiries up 3%? Are hits to our website, first-time visitors up 3%? I mean, where are we pulling the 3% yeah. We had from. to, yeah. I, I think the answer is, you know, we don't have a metric that says go get it. The, the school population is essentially static and we're getting essentially static number of, of those folks. So if we want to prove that, we have to improve the outreach. You see us with right. additional outreach. Um, I think most of us feel like too many students are bleeding out of the system along the way. We actually mm -hmm. have enough inquiries to do this. And then thirdly, you know, the, the customer in front of you is the one that's most important, and we've got 33,000 students. That's where we can, if we keep those students enrolled. So I think um, our, our best get, guess was a reasonable estimate that we think we can control, and, and it would put some, so some wind back in our part sales. Is it came parts off coming my from desk. retention, and then part mm -hmm. is coming from recruitment. Re -re recruitment, or not letting them slip through. That's not necessarily brand new inquiries or? Well, I projected that we would generate 3,523 in brand new inquiries in year one, but the majority of our opportunity is going to be in converting those that have already come in to us. Yeah. We just see that we don't have a process in place right now to keep them, to give them the information they need to answer the phone calls. Um, so we're putting processes in place both for things that we're going to um, send to the students. So that's going to be messaging that's unified and consistent throughout the funnel, as well as what the, the staff will say to the student when they call and the questions that they'll go through. And that's the foundation that we really need to set not only in the admissions part, but what we say on our website and our emails to make sure that everything we say throughout the college is a nice foundation. So next year when I drive more volume, I know that's going to go through the funnel and convert. Let me ask, the, 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 the goal was, we're at 41%, was it, Tanja? 41% 41, and the goal is 46%? Right. To retain, would that be 3% in our enrollment, if we it, maintain it, that, just had the, a modest 5% mm -hmm. 
yeah. increase in improving that. Okay. Yes. Those are the people who have expressed interest. They've reached out right. to us. We feel like we haven't given them the best of all responses to try to, they, they have shown some interest in us. Right. We ought to cultivate that. So that's the. But enrollment has been down the last two years, correct? That's correct, yes. That's correct. So I'm, I'm with um, <coughs> Ms. Westing as far as contingency plans go. Is, okay. I mean, yeah. I, I would. I would not sign up for a 3% increase in enrollment without, uh, you know, part of, and maybe you guys are sick of me today, and I'm sorry, but um, I have three graduating seniors, and so I'm living through a lot of this in my household right now. Um, and a part of what I have seen is intense direct mail, and um, it, the college is coming to them. And it, I'll apologize ahead of time if I hurt anybody's feelings, but my daughter's gotten one letter from SPC. It was very unexciting. Um, it looked like this, which an 18-year-old's not going to read. Um, new college pops in my head because they have beat us over the head like you would not believe, um, to the point that I finally said to her, you should probably apply. It looks like a fun school. Uh, you know, their materials are enticing. Uh, you know, living through the... 3% increase in enrollment as um, as the mom of, of those three graduating seniors. We got a lot of room to improve. Mm -hmm. you, we have never had to do that, and we are learning how to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, and um, let, uh, I want to do one thing. Can I, uh, I don't want to cut that off. I, I think you're doing great, by the way. That's the, you're doing, you're doing just what a board member should do, okay? So please yeah. don't, don't feel awkward. This we're giving you our best thinking, but you, you bring a, a better and different perspective on some things. Was there any other parts? We, we'll see what the legislature is going to do with, with money. I think we're a little understated here. We hope we are. Um, if we put the 3% in the budget, we'll come back with contingent expenses that we can manage going forward. That would seem to me to be the way to, to do this. I, is that? Yes. I'm I'm fine with with the three percent. Um, you talk about. Um, I, I think you just have to clearly define whether or not it is uh, what we're going to. If, if something happens and we don't meet that, that what what our budget is going to look like, and we have to outline that. And okay. We have to be very specific, and then to protect the board members, Doctor Law, the one dollar fee. Right, to course fee. The course fee is not an increase in tuition. I mean, that's why we put it on the course fee, because it is a pledged expenditure to the... Now, if you're against anything going up, somebody can say, I'm well... I'm not against I, anything going up, but yeah. I just I want to be careful. I'm up for reappointment, and I don't want to go to Tallahassee. Mm, Mr. Before. Chairman, I, 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 that's why I'm <laughs> seeing it up. I, you, you know, you have to get a comfort level on, on I'm, I'm uh, a, that. a pledged I'm $1. That. Uh, again, I don't, I, I see the governor periodically. I, I don't think the governor started his campaign because community, uh, state colleges are raising a fee $1. It's no. Universities raising it 15% mm -hmm. as far as the eye can see that, that I think Got him. I, I just want to be careful his, about yeah. being able to hold a line that we're, okay. we're not going crazy, and and I, I don't feel like we have. Number one, number two. I just want to make sure that I'm able to articulate well, what that is at the end of the day, and be fair about it. Yeah, no, I'm. So I'm okay with that. Board members, any more comments and questions? I think this is a great presentation, guys. Um, you know. Um, as Dr. Law said, you know, we don't know all this stuff, so that's what board members are here for. And you, we do different things every day. We bring different expertises to the table. And your questions are welcome and your comments are welcome, Ms. Bello. We need that to be more effective. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, these, some of these folks are not, they're not good at recruitment and marketing. That's why we hire somebody that can bring that to the table. But, you know, some of this stuff is very different, and they want to get it right. So... Don't feel like any of you, don't feel like, you know, what your, your comments are, you know, you're taking up too much time or you're, you're not welcome, because they are. I can tell you that, he, that I have, I think most of us have worked with Dr. Law since he's gotten here now, and you'll see, he'll, he'll go back and tweak it. Mr. Chairman, um, I think 
I'm, I think that's we've got enough input for today to to recycle and come back next month with with I think a, a, a different uh, review and perhaps we can just sort of keep moving to uh, conclude the uh, agenda this morning and Perfect. get everybody out of here. Okay, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Great job. Um, we're down to uh, administrative matters, I believe. Oh, sorry. Financial report. Oh, financial, financial report. report. We didn't do that yet. Yeah. Uh, real, real quick. Um, I, I think our. I, it's it's hard to believe I'm standing here saying we're starting the last quarter of the year. Seems like I was just saying we were starting, but um, I, I think what you've seen happen over the year, though, is very indicative of the contingencies that we've always had built into our budget. Um, some more, some less, depending on our funding. But but as you can see, we we've been able to to make adjustments to. Uh, you know, instructional expenditures and other expenditures to keep spending in line with that, with the drop in tuition that we, we experienced this year. So we're still uh, going into our fourth quarter. We still have a, a 4.8 million surplus, which you will see uh, in the next two months uh, pretty much erode. But uh, w we have full confidence that we will stay within budget this year. And, uh, and and build in more contingencies if we need to next year. Okay. Any questions? Any questions, board okay. members? No. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. We're on to administrative matters. Before we um, take up any of them, um, do, does any board members have any questions on any of these items? Meaning the, except for item uh, 2B. I think Dr. Law is gonna go over that a little bit. Very little. <laughs> okay. But the rest of them are pretty straightforward. One is our equity report, um, the executive administrative managerial professional contracts, and the personnel report. And then the uh, 2A is uh, uh, we're basically moving a lease from Congressman Young uh, to uh, Congressman Jolly, right? That's it. If not, I hear a motion to accept. Um, Item D one A B C and two A. So moved. <laughs> Second. Second. <laughs> All signify by saying aye. Aye. None opposing. We're down to two B dot law um, the proposed land sale and uh, tarpon. Thank you. We uh, this is a reprise of a, an item that you saw about part of a year ago. Uh, we uh, we you authorized a sale to a group that uh, when we got into the negotiations they they could not make it work and I forget who those if I knew I've forgotten the name of the group um, and we separated from them the broker brought us another uh, group racetrack which is uh, you see those folks in, in a lot of places we revisited with them and were able to uh, pull together a, a revised contract not quite as rich as the one we had but it has a few features that we like a little more we control all the monies we control all the decisions um, uh, I think a little deeper pocket uh, the, the goal I, I spoke with uh, I'm sure mr. Oliver wouldn't care because he, he's had so much experience in this I called him and he said you know that the original proposal was to get enough money for us to reinvest in fixing up the entry for the campus itself the drive there and if the if the new contract has enough money for that to occur I think we ought to go ahead with that and with his sort of uh, uh, quiet guidance you have that in front of you I think it's a good contract Brian's done it uh, mr. Lang you have vetted it as I, my right. sources tell me I recommend it mr. chairman I think we ought to go ahead and make this this improvement do I hear a motion to accept item uh, D to B questions Question. One, one question. Uh, what was the what was the flip side of this? Did, I mean, my memory is foggy. If you recall, I hate to Did mention. Did someone it. speak on the? Oh yeah, yeah. That was. The, but that the, was. The, the, yes, that okay, was. Could you just quickly refresh? No, Mr. Balleris. have it uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, Mr. Balleris, who's who was the former provost for whom the new we named a building a dear part of us. Um, 
I don't think he fully understood the nature of the proposal. He thought we were selling the enti uh, an entire piece of land and we were selling a little strip that borders an out parcel, okay? So we dutifully filled him in on, I, 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 what's the amount of land? It's, it's like an acre or two acres, right? But it's as wide as this room at one point and half of that at another point. So um, th there's, no, there's no anticipation that is anything but Good okay. stuff, okay. Uh, and we work through some zoning issues and where the road cuts are and how we get in and out. And um, I, in the end, I think this is a good thing for us. Okay. Mr. Chairman, second. I'm probably moving a second. Any more discussion? I'll signify by saying aye. 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 None opposing. Thank you. Academic matters going to credit curriculum. Item E1. I'm trying to pull it up. Where are we here? Where am I in the book here? T -t 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 e. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I no, that's all right. Don't have it in front it's of for me. The, uh, the approval sought for the following recommended changes to credit Where curriculum for 2014 seven. catalog year. So, I'm not seeing it in my credit agenda. 18 uh, certificates for computer technology. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. I'm sorry. Um, we bring to you on a continuing basis the, uh, the changes in each of our curriculum. I think as a board member, you would be interested to see what's going away and what's replacing it. And the, the, the overall flavor I want you to have is that we are consistently reviewing what we're doing and what our program requirements are. So you see on our CCIT uh, program in engineering and building arts, some, some things on the way out, a whole range of courses that we had not taught in a good long while. So we have pruned those courses out of our inventory and move forward. This is, um, we bring it to you as, you know, you have to take action, but uh, again, I want you to feel that we're always reviewing our curriculum. Do I hear a motion to accept item E1? So moved. Second. So Sorry. properly move and second. Any discussion? I'll signify by saying aye. 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 None opposing, we're on to the consent agenda. Uh, the old business, none new business. Uh, partnership with the uh, uh, University of South Florida Institute of Oceanography uh, Ship Time Program. Uh, uh, former uh, represent, uh, Senator Dennis Jones, uh, just before he left the legislature, was instrumental in bartering us into the FIO program and uh, this is now the the execution of that contract um, it's a great thing it gives our <coughs> students ship time on the research vessels so they do uh, smaller and indeed some longer overnights and uh, our students will be working with uh, other university and graduate students in oceanography research that that's a really good one and the rest are I think simple leases that we're renewing in most every case so I hear a motion to accept item uh, uh, B uh, 1A. Mr. Thank Chairman, you. that's the consent agenda. I'm it, sorry. It is I, on the consent agenda. Right. So you either have to do the whole consent agenda or we have to pull oh, stuff off. Okay. okay. Well, All right. we'll go on down then. Let's keep going. There's nothing else that we uh, See that we really need a report on the rest. It's just um, the action items, the lease it gives for parking. Um, is there any discussion on any of these items, board members? No. Bello, none? You fine? Just reading. I look for a motion to accept the entire consent agenda. So moved. Second. I'll sit in discussion. Signify by saying aye. 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 None opposing. Uh, informational reports, Dr. Law. We, uh, we tee those up, I think, on a quarterly basis. These are uh, longstanding so that you can see the action that takes place away from you, if, um, and those are for information only. Yep. And those have been provided to us, board members, if you'd like to take the time to Read them, they are, and provide it in your packet. 
Um, we are on to the proposed changes of the Board of Trustee Rules. I will now open the public hearing. Uh, are there any public speakers, Laura? None. Um, I think I have to leave it open through this yes. process. So um, there are a couple of changes that we need to vote on here. Dr. Law, could you or sure. or, or, or our council, could you um, go through the first one for me? I'm really interested to know what 6HX23-1.232 Both, I'm sorry, the, let's revisit. We, we informed you last month that, uh -huh. uh, that based on some court cases, the, the law, the, the ability of the college to restrict firearms on campus was changed. We had a prohibition. Now, based on the updated legal guidance, uh, you can have concealed weapons, but they must remain in your car, okay? And our rules didn't reflect that. We were subject to a lawsuit by a group that is uh, obviously promoting that. Uh, we indicated to them that we would change, we would bring our, law, our rules in conformance with the updated uh, court guidance. So that's what the first two rules do that, okay? okay? And um, I, I don't think it's a big deal. I, you know, I, I, I can play it round or flat. I, I'm, nope. I'm not against guns. Nope, I just I'm, wondered, I'm against. I remember, I remember the discussion last. More month guns on just, campus isn't a particularly good thing, but I'm. I understand. <laughs> no, I just works. remember the discussion from yeah. last month. I want to have the opportunity if anybody wanted to say anything before we give the board members an opportunity. With your action today, we believe the lawsuit and the threat of the lawsuit will go away. So okay. we're just in compliance. So thank you for your support on this. All right. Any discussion on this? I hear a motion to accept the uh, proposed uh, changes to the Board of uh, rules, rules Manuals. So moved. Second. M move and second. I'll signify by saying aye. Aye. None opposing. Um, I will now close the public hearing. And now to the President's report. Uh, there was a third rule. Did we do all the rules at once, yes, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Okay, thank you. Okay. We only discussed the first two, but... Right, right. The I third was in compliance with the... Well, yes. We did that. Um, let me take just a couple of minutes. The... Uh, the baccalaureate issue that had gotten our full attention just a few weeks ago is, um, I want to be not cynical, here. It, it's a ceasefire in place. Both sides, we're going to go and revisit some, some concerns that the, the key Senate, senator and others may have had, and then we'll get a chance, I think, to demonstrate the, the success of those programs. Given the way the legislature works, that was the ideal landing zone, that we were, we had only low cards in our hand, and getting a chance to, to come back with better and fuller information, I think is a really good thing. I think we're gonna be okay on this. I, I think everybody is realizing that there's a huge public policy benefit. Nobody knows what the next steps are. The, the, the senator put the money back in the budget. He removed the, uh, the uh, restrictive language. So there, there is though a moratorium in place as we speak right now, that's one. The ability for uh, undocumented students, uh, the students to uh, usually referred to as DREAM Act students, students who are, uh, are residents of our state, have been here for a certain period of time, that continues to make progress and our own Senator Jack Latvala has fought a, uh, an increasingly effective, if not lonely, um, struggle to get a vote on that. And it now appears that the Senate will vote on that. If they vote on it, I suspect both sides will come in agreement on that one. We have been strongly supportive of helping students who, who are residents get to college. I think that's my core job. And, and again, I, it, it's a bigger issue. I'm taking just, just my piece of that. Budgetarily, the, the legislature's not meeting this week. They're in what they call a cone of silence. It's all, it doesn't mean there's no work being done. It's just not being done in public. Um, and we, we, there's a very good appropriation on the House side, a not quite as good appropriation on the Senate side. We spent all last Friday walking around finding as much information as we can. I don't think I have any particular insight. I suspect we're gonna be a little closer to the upside than the downside on that. The good news in all that though, as you saw in the budget, is that while they're moving a lot of pieces around, 
the big thing is the performance dollars. They have implemented funding <coughs> that's tied to academic performance, placement, uh, speed to degree, uh, employment, uh, earnings, those sorts of things, and we come out quite well in that, and even after they've noodled it a little bit, we're on the upside there. That put $2.7 million into our budget, so that's not an inconsequential uh, piece. Um, I think that's pretty much it. I, oh, and we have, we have uh, increased hope that our Bay Pines project will work, and not quite as increased hope regarding the funding for the Clearwater Library, but that's another part of the legislative process that's very arc opaque. Um, if there's a list, only a few people know where the list is, and I know, <laughs> Mr. Gibbons, you have uh, made some calls <laughs> yourself, and I, if you have additional information, I, you didn't have it last Friday when no, I talked to you. No, okay, no, so no. Um, uh, if we can get the Bay Pines piece, we're all right, and you never know, lightning may strike for the Seminole Library. And then so, lastly, just so you know that the library dialogue, there was a big collaborative lab last week so that we have started that process with our, our colleagues from uh, the city of Clearwater, okay? We're gonna make another run at that though because they are putting in five or six million dollars, there's a significant match component to that project and that's one of the criteria that the governor was looking for, that projects could, that could bring a match. So we may be able to get that back on the table, I don't know. Yeah. You never know if it's already decided or not. So, uh, And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, just uh, with you, as the, the dialogue that we had today, we will go ahead and um, make adjustments so that the July meeting is, uh, is canceled yes. and we'll act appropriately then, okay. Yeah. Um, are there any more comments from board members? I have one, is Dr. Carney here? Hey, Dr. Carney. I would be remiss if I did not uh, tell everyone that did not attend the uh, naming celebration for Nick Biller is up in uh, Tarpon Springs was a great event. You did a great job. You and your staff should be commended on that. Thank you for your, your help and support in that. Thanks. Um, and if there's no other comments, our next board meeting uh, May 20th uh, at Midtown Campus at 730. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 Boy, I'm Not funny. <laughs>